Today we are starting our January series, Colonial Music and Libations, by looking at the rise of some of the more popular beverages in our culture, tea, coffee, and chocolate. Joining us today is Amanda Lang, who is the curator of historic interiors at Historic Deerfield. As a Mars Fellow, Ms. Lang has been researching the history of chocolate in early America for the last four years. She is also a member of the Colonial Chocolate Society, a scholarly group of museum professionals, academics, and historians underwritten by the Mars Foundation. Ms. Lang's most recent exhibition, The Canton Connection, Art and Commerce of the China Trade, highlighted Historic Deerfield's remarkable collection of Chinese export art. Please help me welcome Ms. Amanda Lang. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm so pleased to be here, and this is just uh, probably hands down one of the most fabulous interiors that I've ever uh, had the honor to give a lecture within. So I'm very pleased to be here today. So today um, I will go very quickly through um, my slides. Well, tea, coffee, and chocolate are very familiar foods to us, from de drinking a cup of Lipton tea, sipping a Starbucks latte, uh, or mixing up a mug of hot cocoa. But few people ever give, give thought to where these beverages came from or how they shaped and influenced uh, daily life in the past. Before about 1650, uh, an average breakfast would have included a mug of ale, beer, or hard cider, and perhaps wine. Uh, not the best way to start your day, at least if you want uh, to kick it off with uh, an, alert, um, <laughs> an alert mind. The introduction uh, in, into the 17th century, or into 17th century Europe, of three new beverages, coffee, tea, and chocolate, had an immediate and lasting effect on the tastes and habits of the Western world. These three beverages were direct results of international trade and commerce. While the Spanish, English, Dutch, and Portuguese were sailing the oceans for gold and silver and attempting to locate passages to the east and competing for global influence and empires, they stumbled upon these three new exotic beverages. Tea came first from China, coffee from Turkey and Arabia, and chocolate from Mexico and Central America. And I'm gonna first talk about tea, then coffee, then chocolate. Merchants and travelers encountered, encountered tea drinking in foreign lands and quickly adopted the habit. Westerners from around the world came to Canton, China, and I'll point that out with my laser beam. Canton, China is right at the head of the Pearl River, and you can see it's right there in southern China, about as far away from the, uh, the emperor in, in Peking or Beijing as you could possibly get, and that does uh, have a purpose, is because the emperor wanted to separate himself from, um, from things like trade and also from barbarian foreign traders. Well, um, Westerners came from around the world to Canton, China to purchase all types of tea for their home market. And tea, above all other commodities, made Western trade with the Chinese imperative. A French trader named Robert Constant said in the mid-18th century, he remarked, it's tea above all other commodities which draws European vessels to China. He said the ar other articles that comprise their cargoes are taken only for the sake of variety. Tea shrubs, Camellia sienensis, were picked three times a year in early spring, late spring, and late summer. The first crops of tea arrived in Canton in October, with purchases continuing throughout the winter months. Tea purchases for the West can roughly be divided into two categories. Blacks, which composed, if you want to talk about varieties, things like Bohe, Congo, Pico, Pushong, and Sushong, and greens, which go under the various trade names of Haisan, uh, Singlo, Imperial, Twenke, and Gunpowder. And up until the 19th century, though it may surprise you, Americans tended to prefer green teas, especially young hyson, as their favorites. 
Green teas arrived in Canton packed in boxes, while black teas were brought in baskets to dry in warehouses. The ship's super, supercargo or business agent had the responsibility of judging the quality of teas. Because teas could be switched or adulterated, small samples of tea would be brewed in cups for sniffing and tasting, but not for swallowing. Stale tea, maybe last year's tea, or chopped willow or elm leaves were often added to increase the bulk. And Prussian blue or Chinese yellow enhanced the color of tea, while iron filings sometimes were even mixed into the tea to increase the weight. William Melrose, a Scottish tea merchant, complained that he had been tasting and comparing tea all day until I was almost sick and my mouth sore. Well, once selected, the teas were packed into boxes and labeled for the long voyage home. And a man named Amos Porter of Vermont, who actually became a China trader for a very brief time of his life in about 1802 to 1803, talked about this, um, this, uh, this process of preparing the tea for uh, shipment in boxes. And it's kind of interesting how this image that was made for Western traders looks um, very idealized when you hear about how it actually happened. He said, the, tra uh, the chest is made half full of tea poured in. Then the coolie, which is a laborer, steps in upon it, treads there for one or two hours with a leather on his heel full of nails to enable him to stamp the harder. He proceeds in that manner until the chest is full. These coolies are of a low class of citizens and nor very cleanly. Their sweat, spittle, and many fulsome substances are intermixed with this tea, renders it, which renders it almost unfit for use, which looks nothing like what you see there, which all looks very, very sweet and nice. Well, in the mid-17th century, Europeans first used tea as an exotic medicine. And some physicians extolled its positive effects while others damned its properties. And uh, this is quite a bit to read, but I'm just going to pick out a few things. Thomas Garway, who was a London tobacconist and coffeehouse proprietor, issued a broadsheet touting the remarkable curative properties of the drink tea. He said, among other things, it helpeth make the body uh, active and lusty. It helpeth the headache, giddiness, and heaviness thereof. It removeth, removeth obstructions of the spleen, and it overcometh superfluous sleep. And actually, it's interesting to note that, both, uh, that all these three beverages, once they were introduced into the European market, all pretty much around 1650, all of them were introduced as expensive medicines. Well, by the early 18th century, tea had become much more valued as a popular beverage than as a medicine, and its consumption increased dramatically. To meet the growing demand, the English East India Company imported entire cargoes of tea. In 1725, 250,000 pounds of tea were imported, but by 1800, at the end of that century, over 24 million pounds of tea were arriving yearly in England. Although tea's availability had increased, its price remained prohibitive. In the early 18th century, the price of a pound of tea averaged about 12 to 14 shillings, equal to one week's wages for a skilled craftsman. Despite its high cost, tea gradually replaced ale and beer as the beverage of choice for common folk. As early as 1734, one New Yorker complained I am credibly informed that tea in China cost the province yearly near the sum of 10,000 pounds, and people that are least able to go to the expense must have their tea, though their families want bread. Nay, I am told, often pawn their rings and plate, which is silver, to gratify themselves in that piece of extravagance. Well, preparing, serving, and consuming tea required new containers and utensils and new skills with, with which to use them successfully and gracefully. Pouring hot water on dried leaves and drinking the brewed liquid called for a variety of equipment, and as opposed to tea drinking in China, where the tea leaves were actually brewed in the teacup itself. 
Uh, tea drinking in early America, and early Boston, was a very elaborate affair. You might have had to have um, a tea kettle for brewing up uh, boiling hot water, a tea pot, preferably in silver or in porcelain, a tea canister for holding and keeping the leaves dry, so that's for uh, holding the tea leaves, a sugar bowl for keeping the chunks of white sugar, not maple sugar, not brown sugar, not of that. It has to be the very expensive white sugar. Sugar tongs and uh, for dispensing the white sugar to the, the teacups. Uh, creamer or a milk uh, pot uh, for those who preferred milk in their tea. Uh, teacups and saucers, teaspoons, uh, perhaps a spoon tray for holding those wet teaspoons off of your tea table, uh, a slop bowl or a waste bowl, which is at the top, which is for uh, the used tea leaves or for any waste, you know, any extra cold liquid tea might have been thrown in the slop bowl. And then you might need, of course, all those other things, which include tables. You can't, you can't drink this on the floor. You're going to have to have an appropriate number of chairs, and you're going to have to have a specified form for serving tea, which is called a tea table. Well, this proliferation of highly specified, specialized artifacts offered new opportunities for consumption and display. But more importantly, it turned tea drinking into a ritual. The formal consumption of tea also encouraged elegant movements and manners and speech. One writer in New York City commented that the younger men of the city who were perceived as excessively awkward and ridiculous when it became obvious that they were altogether unacquainted with the ceremony of, at the tea table, it was recommended to them that they buy a set of china or if they should be less extravagant, earthenware, such as cups, saucers, slop basin, et cetera, and that they should employ a, a knowledgeable hostess to teach them the laws, rules, customs, phrases, and names of the tea utensils. Well, foreign travelers were often um, befuddled by the elaborate etiquette and the nonverbal communication used in American tea drinking. A prince on a visit to Philadelphia in 1782 found himself utterly unable to decline politely another cup of tea. And he wrote in his diary, he said, I partook of the most excellent tea, and I should even be drinking it now, I believe, if the French ambassador had not charitably notified me at the 12th cup that I must put my spoon across it when I wish to finish with this sort of warm water. He said to me, it is almost as ill-bred to refuse a cup of tea when it is offered to you as it would be indiscreet for the mistress of the house to propose a fresh one when the ceremony of the spoon had notified her that we no longer wish to partake it. So he just didn't know the nonverbal cue, which was to put your teaspoon on top of a teacup when you didn't want another cup of tea. And since he didn't know that, she's like, oh, he wants more. He wants more. Why, why he wants more. And of course, it's her duty to supply him more because uh, it's, it shows hospitality. It's an expensive beverage. And, and of course, he's a prince from France. What is she going to do but continue to serve him more because he's saying he wants more. So there you go. Well, of course, you can't talk about tea without talking about its political associations, particularly here in the heart of Boston. Well, during the early days of the American Revolution, tea and tea drinking became very political and politicized. In the 1760s, uh, the British government began to impose a tax on tea, first through the Stamp Act of the 1765 and later with the Townsend Act of 1767. Um, those tea taxes were repealed, but um, uh, the, the, uh, what happened was is that to demonstrate its power to tax the colonies, Parliament retained that duty on tea. And thereafter, Americans started to purchase mostly smuggled tea from Holland. 
When Parliament passed the Tea Act of 1773 to help the nearly bankrupt East India Company by eliminating all tax on tea exported to America, the company's tea, although still subject to that Townsend tax, was now cheaper than smuggled Dutch tea. Well, because the English East India Company appointed only certain American merchants to act as agents to distribute tea, many Americans rejected the East, English, uh, the East India Company tea. Throughout the colonies, the Tea Act met with opposition. Politicians and citizens resisted taxation without representation. In most places, they stored this English East India Company tea or sent it back, but not here in Boston. Led by Samuel Adams, and you can see, well, this is Bostonians uh, tarring and feathering the excise man, which is actually a very nasty thing to do. It's not quite that funny, but uh, you can see that they are drowning the, the excise man with a pot of hot liquid with tea on the side of it. And you can see in the background uh, the Bostonians pouring tea off of a ship. And we'll go forward once to talk a little bit about the Tea Party. Well, led by Samuel Adams, the citizens in Boston would not permit the unloading of three ships, British ships, that arrived in Boston in November 1773 with 342 chests of tea. Massachusetts Royal Governor Thomas Hutchinson, however, would not let the ships return to England unless the colonists had paid the duty. On the evening of December 16th of 1773, a group of Bostonians, many of them disguised as Native Americans, boarded the vessels, dumped the tea into Boston Harbor, and goading Brit Britain into harsh retaliations. Um, particularly uh, a, political, um, a political act known as the Intolerable Acts. The laws closed the port of Boston to trade and curtailed the powers of the Massachusetts Assembly and local town meetings, and provided for the housing of troops in private houses and exempted British officials from trial in Massachusetts. Wow. Um, these acts further um, alienated American colonists and hastened the start of the American Revolution. A big whoops on their part, I suspect. Um, just quickly going through tea, since our time is running out. Oh. Um, um, quickly going through coffee. Um, tea has received a lot of research, and coffee less so. Uh, coffee is an evergreen shrub that's native to northeastern Africa, and it was probably domesticated for its caffeine-loaded berries in the Ethiopian highlands around 800 AD. Coffee beans are produced uh, in a complicated process of removing the seeds from the covering of pulp and mucilage. The beans must be spread out to dry for several days and then heated in a drum. It seems that by the 14th and 15th century, the coffee plant was being cultivated around the shores of the Red Sea, and by 1638, coffee was being sold at rather exorbitant prices in Venice, where uh, the poet Sir George Sandys said that the Turks and this is our area. Of course, we know a little bit more about Yemen than we used to. Um, the Turks, he said, uh, chatted most of the day over coffee, which he described as black as soot and tasting not much unlike it. In the 17th century, just like tea and chocolate, coffee was considered an exotic beverage and was used as an expensive medicine by the upper classes. Um, coffee was thought to quicken the spirits, make the heart lightsome, was beneficial for digestion and is good against headache. Hmm, sounds good. Uh, medical uh, experts also warned that coffee was a diuretic, and they thought that that was bad because the body would um, had to keep its humors in balance, and they thought as a diuretic it would drain the physical humors from the body, and that would not be a very good thing. But coffee, um, in its positive aspects, was not an inebriant. That was the one thing about these three new uh, beverages that was really so, um, really fabulous, is that you weren't drinking um, a, an alcoholic beverage for your breakfast. James Howell said, "'Tis found already that this coffee drink hath caused a greater sobriety among nations, whereas formerly apprentices and clerks with others used to take their morning draft of ale, beer, or wine, which by the dizziness they cause in the brain ma made many unfit for business, they, now, they use now to play the good fellows in this wakeful and civil drink. 
Uh, the rise of coffee houses was a direct result of this um, uh, uh, importation of coffee uh, starting around 1650 in England. Uh, different uh, professions gathered at different coffee houses. Uh, insurers would hang out at Lloyd's Coffee House, and that's the formation today of the Lloyd's Insurance Agency. But people who uh, were journalists or people who were ship owners or ship captains would gather at different coffee houses. And there's a typical scene called the coffee house mob, where people are drinking coffee. And coffee was a, a, the cheapest of these three new beverages. And basically, for the price of a penny, you could get a cup of coffee and be able to read newspapers all day and smoke pipes. Unfortunately, um, the King Charles II was very disturbed by the uh, proliferation of coffee houses in late 17th century England, and he called for the suppression of coffee houses because he thought they would be fomenting rebellion. And if you tried to stamp out Starbucks today, what would happen? You know, it's you would expect an a, a revolt, and that's what happened in England: is that there was a big uproar of disapproval, and the king backed down on the implementation of getting rid of coffee houses. There were some coffee houses in Boston, um, and coffee did also make its way into the private life of middle and upper class families in the 18th century, but it was never as popular as tea. Uh, in Boston, you have Dorothy Jones uh, receiving a license as early as 1670 to sell coffee and chocolato in her, in her tavern. Um, in the colonies, there seemed to be no distinct difference between a tavern and a coffee house. Many people think it's the Boston Tea Party that caused uh, coffee to surge in prominence. And there is a little bit of truth to that. It seems that uh, after uh, the Continental Congress passed a, a resolution against tea consumption, you do have very famous people like John Adams saying to his wife Abigail in 1774, I, uh, tea must be universally renounced, I must be weaned, and sooner the better. Uh, but uh, coffee uh, enjoyed this brief association with independence, but eventually this beverage became as politically charged as tea. And with the American boycott of 1774, it included not only English goods, but also goods from the English West Indies, which included coffee from the islands of Jamaica, St. Vincent, Dominica, and Grenada. So if the Boston Tea Party didn't cause, uh, tea, uh, didn't cause coffee uh, to become, uh, or didn't cause America to become a nation of coffee drinkers in the 19th century, what was uh, the reason for the drinks, tremendous growth in America. Well, what actually happened is it's Brazil. Uh, Brazil's ability to increase coffee production without increasing price was really, the, was really one of the root causes for its tremendous growth in America. When Brazil gained its independence in 1822, it created the largest coffee plantations in the world. The other factors that worked out to make coffee America's number one drink was the um, immigration of millions of Northern Europeans, particularly Germans and Scandinavians, who were all, uh, already predisposed to drinking coffee. And then finally, war uh, also assisted in coffee's assimilation into daily life. During the Civil War, the Union troops considered coffee necessary for military victory. General Sherman called it the essential element of the ration. Con and he concluded that coffee and sugar ration be carried along even at the expense of bread for which there are many substitutes. So don't get rid of coffee. And finally, I'm gonna talk about chocolate, which is actually one of my favorite things, and I'm sure one of yours too. Um, for thousands of years, I think we're just fascinated with chocolate. And one of the things that I think is most unusual is how the cacao plant grows, is that it is unusual in that pods form not only at the, uh, it is a fruit, they not only form at the end of branches, but they actually form along the trunks as well. And you can see this person is harvesting the pods off of the trunks and the branches. 
Uh, when you split open those pods, you get this very mucilaginous uh, coated seeds inside, which are left to ferment for about a week. And then those seeds are spread out to dry. And then you roast those uh, seeds and then you have to winnow off the outer shell, this cocoa shell, which today many people use or many businesses use for mulch for your gardens. And then you have to grind the resulting uh, cacao nibs inside into a paste. And you can see he's doing this on a matate, which is a uh, granite stone with a bed of charcoal or a box of charcoal underneath. And he's using what is called a matate imano, or in uh, early American English, would have been called a chocolate stone and roller. So moving along, uh, a good cup of chocolate would have been made by grating up these lozenges of chocolate and adding them to wine or water or to milk. I just wanted to give you a comparison between the values of these three beverages. I said coffee was the cheapest, and it actually does prove true. Uh, this is a bill from Deerfield, uh, where I'm from, and you have 40 pounds of coffee, 40 pounds of chocolate, and 40 pounds of tea. Um, and each pound is worth, uh, as you can see, it's worth uh, what's um, at the end or before the strike. So coffee is worth eight shillings a pound, chocolate is worth 10 shillings a pound, and tea is worth a whopping 37 shillings per pound and eight pence. So that's an amazing amount of money right in the middle of the 18th century. So pound for pound, uh, t uh, co uh, coffee was really gonna be most, the most bang for the buck. Uh, as we said, uh, chocolate was used as a medicine um, I guess its most prominent use was used as a good digestive. It was also used to help people um, restore their strength. You can almost think of chocolate as a, a nutritional benefit, almost like boost or ensure. If you couldn't eat, if you were very ill and weak, you could drink chocolate, and that might help restore your strength and give you this incredibly fat, nutritious, give you this big high caloric boost in order for you to um, uh, uh, get beyond your illness and, and renew your strength. You do have um, chocolate drinking in Boston, and that's very prominently explained in the Judge Samuel Sewell's diary, which is pretty amazing. Uh, Judge Samuel Sewell actually goes to visit his friend, um, um, uh, Lieutenant Governor uh, Stoughton. And what's interesting about what they do is he writes about a chocolate, and he says that Massachusetts, this is Judge Sewell writes what they, about what they had for breakfast, and he said Massachusetts and Mexico met at his honors table because what they had for breakfast was chocolate and venison. And what they had for chocolate was not necessarily what we would think of as confectionery chocolate. The chocolate I'm talking about in the 18th century, almost all of it was used to make uh, beverage chocolate. It was ground up, it was combined with liquid, liquid and it was drunk as a beverage. Oops. We do have evidence of chocolate uh, being sold in taverns here with coffee, tea, and chocolate being offered by Mary Ballard. You also um, ha have the use of chocolate primarily taken, as opposed to tea and coffee, which could be served after dinner. Chocolate was primarily taken as a breakfast beverage. Uh, it gave people um, a large amount of calories uh, early in the morning. Uh, to get them going in the day. And a little bit of stimulation. It contains theobromine, a little bit of caffeine, but it certainly didn't give you that boost of, um, of, of stimulation. It gave you a boost of energy. What's interesting about chocolate that's different from all these other uh, types of drinks is that tea was very easy to make. If you think about tea, it's just taking tea leaves and pouring water over it. 
but uh, chocolate's a little bit different. Uh, the preparation of chocolate could be quite complicated. It's not like Swiss Miss is today. Swiss Miss is mostly non-fat powdered milk and sugar and cocoa. Beverage chocolate, um, what it did is that it had, it was composed of basically 53% cocoa butter. So when you ground up that chocolate, these chocolate lozenges or tablets which were created and sold at local stores, and you mix that with wine or water, what you had was um, something if you let it settle uh, was almost gonna turn into a vinaigrette. Uh, it was going to separate, but the fat was going to start to um, float up to the top. So it was really, the fat could be one of its detracting characteristics, as well as being extremely nourishing. Fat in the 18th century, we think of that as being very bad in our diet today. Fat, bad. You want to avoid fat, you want to go on a low-fat diet. In the 18th century, fat is fabulous. Uh, you do so much work, you're expending maybe just doing your normal work about 4,000 calories a day. So you need a lot of energy food, and fat is fantastic. So thick with cocoa butter, the chocolate had to be milled with a stirring rod or a chocolate mill, also known as a moline, prior to pouring. This moline was typically made of wood and measured about 10 to 12 inches. When whirled between the hands, the notched or roughened knob produced um, a liquid with uniform consistency, and it raised the desired froth. And that's one thing about chocolate in the 18th century which was essential, is a good cup of chocolate had a very thick, frothy head on top of it. And you can probably think of a good cup of chocolate today with marshmallows or with whipped cream on top of it, that whipped cream is probably a culinary vestige of that froth that was created by using the moline or the chocolate mill and whipping up the chocolate between your hands. Chocolate, unfortunately, never received the popularity of tea in colonial America. It had definite uses in the military as an energy food. It also was used in nursing by, by doctors as a food for the sick. Uh, it was also frequently used as a breakfast food. Um, it's interesting, vessels for the production of chocolate are actually pretty rare, but in Boston, you're so lucky. At the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, they own the largest collection of 18th century silver chocolate pots. Um, and they're actually, they're just really spectacular. These are some that uh, are in the Museum of Fine Arts Boston's collection. You can see that they are not just all the same, but the one unifying element to all these chocolate pots, and they're actually larger than you would think, they're not small things, is that they have a removable finial. You see this top knot here? Some of them actually, that one has a chain attached. All of these finials are removable. And why is that? Why would you need a removable finial? What that reveals is there's a hole in the lid. And why would you need a hole in the lid and a remo removable finial? It's because for chocolate, exactly, you've got it, is that you've got to have a hole in the, in the lid for the insertion of that essential stirring rod, that chocolate mill. So that is really, if you looked at it, you would say, well, that could be, you know, that could be for tea, that could be for coffee, especially the John Coney example that's up here you know, that could even, and might have, done double duty for serving of coffee, but um, also did duty for the serving of chocolate in a very elegant way. Uh, one of the reasons why I became interested in chocolate is Historic Deerfield, where I work, also has one of these rare 18th century chocolate pots made by a Boston silversmith named Zachariah Brigden. I'm just going to quickly say that there were chocolate cups and saucers. This is an advertisement in a Boston newspaper that really does distinguish teacups and chocolate cups uh, separate from, you know, you, you do have separate things, chocolate cups. Usually they're, they're larger in capacity and have, uh, are a little bit taller for the accommodation of that frothy head. But actually it's quite interesting, um, and I will go forward, is that you find other things in newspapers that you're really not looking, looking for. Is that people, you know, it's interesting, I use a mug, you would think, oh, you use a mug for a lot of different things. 
sometimes you, you can use a mug for, you know, getting, uh, for drinking a cup of coffee, but it can also be used for getting kibble for your dog or be used to hold pens. And the same thing kind of applies to, uh, to chocolate drinking is that, yes, you can use a very specific form for drinking chocolate, but in this case, it actually is, um, we, I found out that in this very interesting murder case or attempted murder case, uh, it revealed that uh, a man named Mr. Humphrey Scarlett, his wife and two children in Boston, Massachusetts, they accused their two enslaved African Americans, a man named Yaw and a boy named Caesar, of attempting to murder them by mixing arsenic or what they called rat's bane into their morning cup of chocolate. The, um, beyond being a fascinating case, uh, the article also included a reference as to how chocolate was made and consumed. Another slave in the family named Betty also fell ill when she licked her master's porringer after he had been to breakfast. So now we know, in addition to specific chocolate cups, porringers, these multi-purpose serving vessels, uh, usually composed of silver or pewter or pottery, fashioned as a small bowl with a tab handle, um, could have been used to serve chocolate as well. The form went out of style pretty quickly in England, but Americans retained these useful forms to eat soups and stews and uh, thick pottages uh, well into the 19th century. And while I would have said maybe five years ago that these, this would have been appropriate for soups and stews and other types of kind of thick liquids, I never would have thought that they would have drunk chocolate out of this. But now, you know, here's proof positive that these forms were used for something completely different. Well, I want to um, close by inviting you to Historic Deerfield, which is about two hours west of here in western Massachusetts, just this side of the Berkshires, not too far. Uh, we reopen in mid-April, but on Saturday, February 13th, we have a special event that might interest you. We have something called the American Heritage Chocolate Festival, and the day's program presents historical information on chocolate and chocolate-related objects in the 18th century. And we also serve savory and sweet foods that are made by the Deerfield Inn. There are demonstrations of cacao roasting and grinding, and a chocolate connoisseurship class by a local uh, gourmet shop owner, and a silversmithing demonstration by a man named Steve Smithers, and a lecture on the development of a chocolate museum that's gonna be happening in Rhode Island. So I encourage you all to come. Well, thank you very much. We have a few minutes for some questions. Get them back. From what you're saying, it sounds like chocolate as a beverage came much earlier than chocolate as a solid food to eat. So when did, how did that happen? And when, when did people start eating chocolate more than they were drinking it? A uh, very good question. Um, chocolate as a solid, as, as a beverage did come much earlier than chocolate as, as a food. In the 18th century, I guess you could say maybe 99% of chocolate consumed would have been chocolate consumed as a, as a beverage. There are very few recipes in the 18th century, but there are some for um, some desserts that use chocolate, uh, such as chocolate-covered nuts, so that would have been used as, as some dessert foods. But those are recipes that are few and far between, where chocolate is used as a flavoring for dessert. But when you speak about confectionery chocolate, um, a lot of the trouble was that the presence of cocoa butter is that it was a very, very difficult uh, substance to work with. And what made the difference, even though at the time it wasn't, wasn't really uh, readily utilized, was in 1828 when a Dutch chemist named Koenrad van Houten discovered the process of being able to squeeze out um, the excess cocoa butter. Uh, and uh, he was able to defat the cocoa butter down to, from about 53% to about 30%. Um, and he squeezed that excess cocoa butter out, creating a, a powdered uh, chocolate, which, could, which is what is now um, um, uh, 
cocoa powder, and this excess cocoa butter resulted, which at the time didn't really have a use. It was just sort of like, oh, this excess cocoa butter. So what it became useful in is the confectionery business, which eventually gets started in the, in the later 19th century with a specifically French and Swiss confectionery chocolate manufacturers along with American ones as well. So you don't get a lot of confectionery chocolate being produced until after the 1850s, surprisingly enough where you get this sort of burgeoning confectionery candy industry coming along, which, which takes advantage of that because they needed that excess cocoa butter. I'm not a good confectionery chocolate historian, but they do use that excess cocoa butter to add back into um, to the chocolate at different stages of the process. Hi, yes. I've seen chocolate being made and they said it's not a sweet beverage the way it's, it's not a sweet thing the way you first get it. When did we add sweet to it, do you know? Well, when you're just grinding the cacao nibs, it's not sweet at all. It's an exceptionally bitter um, type of um, food. And so that was something, uh, when I, I kind of glossed over this, but when uh, the first people who, it's a new world food, and the first people who use chocolate as, uh, as a food or as a beverage uh, were the um, were the people of uh, you know the indigenous populations of um, S South America, the Incas, the Maya, as well as um, as the Aztecs, who were great lovers of chocolate. And what they did, the Aztecs, is that they ground up the chocolate. They added peppers, and they usually added some sort of grain like corn. And uh, sometimes, sometimes they added honey to make it a little bit sweeter, but usually they drank it as a savory beverage. And that beverage was only given to men because they thought it was way too stimulating to give to women and children. But as far as sugar is concerned, the first people to add sugar to the beverage were the Spanish when uh, uh, Hernando Cortez, the conquistador, took the beverage to Spain in about 1520. That's when sugar started to be added to, um, to the beverage in order to make it very sweet. And in the process, once you grind it, uh, as you're grinding it on the matate, it um, takes the form, even though when, it's, it's almost like peanuts. If you've ever ground peanuts, uh, they start out as being very crumbly, but then they almost take this honey or taffy, you know, very honey-like consistency because the oil is, uh, the, the fats is, is being expressed out of them. So it takes on this very honey-like consistency, and that's a good time that you can add your flavorings as you're grinding it in. And so when people in the 18th century, when they received this chocolate, it usually did have some sugar added to it, but in recipes you often say that sugar could be added to it to your own taste. Well, Amanda, thank you so much sure. for joining us today. Thank you.